Okay, hey everybody, this is your boy Jim Austin, Jim Austin Online. I'm so glad to be here with you. We're doing my uh, bi-weekly podcast, The Austin File. And The Austin File is about what's going on in the Metroplex, um, commercial real estate, keeping you up on the latest and the greatest. And if you didn't know, I've been doing that for 40 years. And I talk to interesting people. We're here up in the stockyards at the uh, Western Heritage Center, which is home of the Austin Company, Jim Austin Online, a bunch of tenants, and the National Multicultural Western Heritage Museum. So we're here in my office with one of my closest buddies. We've been, he's big time, you know, big time. <laughs> and I want to introduce you to my friend. I got to get that T.D. Smyers. How you Good doing, you. Good sir? Good to see you, Jim. Thanks for having me. I thought you said you had interesting people. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Must be sometimes, the the list. sometimes some slip through. <laughs> some okay. some slip through. Thank slip you. through. But uh, it's good to see you, man. I um, We've known each other. When, when were you the commander of the base? Finished up that role and retired in 2011. So I got there in, uh, in 08. So, yeah, we've known each other a long time. A long About time. 12 years or so. Well, in here we have the naval base. I want to talk about that a little bit. but. Sure. I want to talk to you about where you grew up, and you know, and, and you're just an interesting cat, and you've done some big things, man, within the the, the walls of Tarrant County, Fort Worth, and, 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 and the nation. And beyond, right, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Stuff that I would have never predicted. But, yes, um, sir. Well, I grew up near here, out in Boyd, in Wise County. That's uh -huh. my hometown. I grew up in Boyd, went there, graduated high school in 1980, and then uh, went to the Naval Academy right out of high school. Was 17 years old and uh, went there and uh, did four years at the academy and finished up and then built a career in aviation okay. and uh, commanded a squadron of combat air crews out of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, wound up doing some time in the Pentagon, which was a lot of a lot, very interesting place to work. And then, and uh, a short story yeah. when I was at Howard University, uh -huh. Washington, D.C., the Black Mecca, I had a job with IBM and IBM came out with the new Selectra typewriter. And all the government agencies were buying them. And I had the, the honor to go into all the government entities, go in, wasn't a major job, but go in, bust them out of the crate, boom, 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 boom and make sure they work. Set them so, all up. That had to have taken you a while. Right. Yeah. 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 I went into the Pentagon. Awesome. You know, it's, they would deliver them and do that. But that some kind of place, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh my God. <laughs> you know, you got to do a background check and everything. You yeah. just don't come in there. I, I was I was lost the first week and a half I was there. I took a different route to get to the office every day because I wasn't sure how to get there. <laughs> they right. have the rings. They have the rings. They have the rings. And then the for the most part, it's pretty simple, right? Rings and hallways and like spokes on a wheel. The problem is they built some things in there that block off certain parts of it. So you have to go around and you, that's when you get into the maze and figure your way around. But it was a fascinating time and uh, in to be where decisions are made in the Navy. And then I came here to command. I was the eighth commanding officer of Naval Air Station Fort Worth, Joint Reserve Base. Eighth? Eighth. That's big. You know, I remember <laughs> when you came to town, and I always have a rule to meet the important people that run things in Fort Worth. So we met and yep. immediately became friends. Yep. And how many years did you do that? I did that for, for three and a half, almost four years. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. rotate. They move those cats in and They out. do. Normally, it's only a two-year tour. Uh, I'd love to tell you I got extended because I was doing such a great job, but the real reason I got extended is because the officer that was going to be my relief had just gone to a job with the Secretary of Defense's office that he was required to fulfill an obligation there of an additional year. So they called me and asked me if I would stay in command. I said, this has got to be a crank call. This is, this is, nobody gets this. And I said, of course I will. And so I got to stay there almost four years. It was great. So it was good to see things that we had put into the budget actually get built. Because uh, okay. with a shorter tour, you don't normally get to see that. So it was really neat to see some of those things come How out. many uh, um, true, How many members of the base are there? There's about 13,000 full-timers, and then there's another, uh, I would say probably about that plus of uh, reservists okay. that drill at the base. Okay. And then, of course, the base's staff is about 600 people. Half of them are uniformed military. The other half are civilian. Okay. Well, that was an honor, and 
thank you for doing a good job yeah, because thanks. you left that and did some other things too. I uh, re retired in 2011 and then I went to work with the American Red Cross as a regional CEO. I uh, did that for four years. A lot of people think, wow, that must have been a real culture shock going from the military into nonprofits. But the reality was the military is very logistics based, right? It's about getting people and hardware to a mission site. The Red Cross is the same way, people and hardware to a mission site, in that case, disaster relief. So it was actually a pretty smooth transition and enabled me to do it smoothly and learn nonprofits. I uh, did that for four years and then uh, came to take over United Way of Tarrant County and uh, led that for four years until I turned over to my very good friend and incredibly capable leader who's leading that place to new, new heights now, and that's Leah King. Sure. So. I was with her today at the um, State of the County mm -hmm. with uh, Glenn Whitley. So. Um, I saw her there today, but yeah, she's doing some amazing she's, things. She's great. We hear, we her and I have talked, but I haven't connected with her physically since we've been in town. So I may run by the office on the way out. So. Sure, sure. It's just amazing. It's practically a, yeah. around. Yeah, we'll walk over there like a lunchtime walk. And we're in the historic stockyards where uh, Fort Worth is where the West begins. And up here in the stockyards, it's just some amazing things going on. There's 5,000 people that come up and visit the stockyards i'm just trying to get one percent to come through my museum how's it going yeah i mean we're 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 good we're good we've been closed because of COVID. yeah and um yeah yeah so just budgetary strains but it's going good as far as our mission of educating people about the fact that 40 percent of the cowboys were people of color you know and now that you're here i, re I really need to connect with the new commander yeah. out there at the base to see if we can do some things. Because in the museum that you'll tour, we have the Tuskegee Airmen and the Buffalo Soldiers. Awesome. Yeah. We um, we recently, I say we, meaning one of the commanding officers um, after I left, uh, renamed one of our streets after the Tuskegee Airmen uh, on the base. Because mm -hmm. sometimes those those uh, roads don't have names or they're like A Road you know, or something like that, Row A, Row B. And uh, we can go in and name them after historical figures from our services. And that was one of the ones that was done just a few years ago. So okay. that'd be good to make that kind of connection. In that way. Sure. Yeah, I've been out there. There was a ceremony where you recognize some Tuskegee Airmen out at the base. Yeah. So I've been out there a few times. And all. About time you made it back out again. Heck yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. I think you can introduce me or at least I can call them and say, I know you yeah. and They'll I, give me a cup of coffee. I, it won't surprise you to know I've already teed your name up to the CEO's office. I'm actually meeting with him in a couple of weeks. So okay. We can, okay. I'll make note of that. Well, I'll give you some literature to take with sure. you. So, you know, I mean, major positions, you know, the base, you know, um, Red Cross. And I remember that and then United Way and I'm reading my business press, which I tell people, if you're in business, you need to subscribe to the business press because it lets you know everything's going on. And I see on the front page, and then I read through, there's like five pages in the magazine wow. that, that, you know, Smyers is back in town. So mm -hmm. tell me what's going on with being back in town that you left a legacy and you are a legacy and <laughs> you're here. Well, being interviewed on my podcast. <laughs> well, I appreciate being here. And it was funny that when I saw the cover, <laughs> the <laughs> photo they used, and those who are listening that haven't seen it, it's me wearing one of my radius sailing shirts, hoisting the Dominican flag on my sailboat. Um, my wife and I, after uh, we left United Way, after I left United Way, uh, my wife and I went sailing. And we spent a couple of years sailing up and down the east coast of the U.S., uh, into the Bahamas twice. And then down into the Caribbean to uh, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Whoa, that's, and, uh, that's some heavy stuff, it bro. It was an incredible time. Uh, two years of bliss punctuated by stark terror. <laughs> you know, when, yeah. things, right, when things didn't go right sometimes. Sometimes you have weather that you didn't expect or your uh, things on the boat broke. And so, uh, you know, that when you're there and it's only you and your wife, that can go one of two ways. <laughs> it could go really poorly, or you can come together as a team. And well, we were blessed that the latter was the case. We, uh, Barbara and I, really came together around uh, things that would happen that we needed to respond to quickly and, and decisively. 
And so we worked together great and enjoyed our time there. And um, we were actually having a great time moving down through the islands and um, decided to go ahead and hang it up and come back to shore for a few years, mainly for family reasons, yes. um, aging parents. And um, I've got some new grandchildren. And so it was kind of, let's spend a little time with family and maybe we'll look at going back and doing it again sometime. Yeah, that's Gilligan Island kind of stuff, man. It <laughs> really yeah. was. There were lots of times Barbara and I would drop the anchor off of an island and we were the only people there. Beach all to ourselves, fishing all to ourselves, and it was it was a beautiful way of life uh, for a couple of years. And uh, so Some things I still miss about it once in a while, like catching yellowfin tuna and that kind of stuff. Are you going to write a book? I think so. Um, people have been asking a lot about it. I actually put a little video online. It's a uh, it's three years of sailing because we owned the boat for a year before we went full time. So three years of sailing condensed into a 90 second video. <laughs> it's, really, right. it's really concise. I had to really edit it. But, um, and we've had a lot of people ask us that want to go do that. Um, how you go about doing it? How do you set up? How do you buy a boat? How do you find a boat? The right kind of boat? Uh, how do you train for it? And those kind of things. So we help people whenever we can that want to do that. But I always thought it'd make a good story sometime. So I might just put no, pen to paper. It does sound like it's interesting. And now, moving forward, you know, how many grandkids you have? I have two. And my uh, my oldest daughter has given me two. And then my middle daughter is working on a family now. Okay. And then uh, Barbara's children are both of the age where uh, they're with significant others and they're talking marriage and that kind of stuff. So we know we're just around the corner for more grandkids. So, so you have a blended family. I do. There's, uh, yes. I have three biological daughters. My wife, Barbara, has a son and a daughter, and they're just all our kids. Right? Yeah, that's that's what you do. I'm saying here, I have four biological and one, you know, about my wife. So, yeah. yeah, it's just part of the times, you know. It is. It is. It can be a challenge at times, too, as you know. Sure. Right? sure. But um, but they're they're all great kids in their own route, in their own way, and they've... Uh, They've gotten gotten a good good move into life, so that's okay. a good thing. So now you're back in Fort Worth. So what's the story now that you're back? So sort of, we uh, most of the time I do is in Fort Worth. However, Barbara and I, we uh, were living in a home that we had purchased as a rental property, um, renting to kids that went to te uh, to uh, uh, Texas State University down in San Marcos, and uh, we had bought the house because uh, Brooke was going there, Barbara's daughter Brooke. And so she finished up, moved out on her own. All the leases were up. So we actually had that house on the market. Well, then we decided to sell the boat. So now we're, we're going to be without a boat, without a home on the water or without a home on land. So we took the house off the market and we live there now. And so I commute up from that area. Uh, and so we're looking to move back up into this area, maybe when it becomes a little more of a buyer's market yes. in real estate. Yes. And yes. Uh, so we're, uh, so I am. Um, Started looking around when we got back on shore. Uh, I was enjoying not doing anything for a while, like retirement can get you know get get you used to not doing too much of anything, but fixing fences and hanging garage door openers and fishing and that kind of stuff. But um, I was looking for teams to lead again after a while. And um, John Wright, who I had known for a long time because he trained my team at United Way in leadership. Uh, he came and talked to me about maybe jumping on board with Simple Leadership Strategies. Uh, the, the John Wright? The John Wright. The oh, one and only. Yeah. John Wright. Yeah. The, 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 what do you call he's it? Been on Rat your, Pack. He's been on your show. Yeah, he's been here. <laughs> okay. I've seen yeah. his clip. And yeah. Um, But yeah, he, he and I talked about it. And leadership development was always something I wanted to do. It's, it's, I don't have a marketable skill, right? I'm not a, I'm not a plumber or an electrician or, or a diesel mechanic. Although I learned how to be one on the boat pretty good, pretty good. Diesel mechanic. But, um, so what I've done is lead. I've led teams. I've led crews. I've led a base. I've led a couple of nonprofits. I've actually started one up. So for me, having the opportunity to take that 40 years of leadership experience and use leverage that to pass the torch on to the next generation has always been something I wanted to do anyway. So when John approached me about joining Simple Leadership Strategies, I said, I, I love it because it's the only leadership development that I ever found to be worthwhile. A lot of times it's a waste of time. It's an event-based thing, one and done. Somebody comes in and lectures everybody and whips them all up with these grand ideas about leadership. And then that team leaves and the team that's been trained is left to go back to the urgent needs of their business. 
John had something different, and I experienced it as a client, where the leadership lesson stuck because they were undergirded the whole way with accountability and steps that would require each student to build these into their habit patterns. It was really powerful. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. So I came on board as the chief executive officer. Uh, business operations is largely um, my responsibility. John stays on as founder and president and he is working curriculum and facilitation staff. So together, we think we got a pretty good team to grow this. Yeah, I like John. I like good man. John. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Now, now you're back mm -hmm. and you're in the area and doing some things. Tell me what a day would be like being on the, you know, the, the sailboat. The boat? Yeah, the it was boat. a. So our boat was a 44 foot sailing catamaran. So it had two hulls. Okay. Barbara and I lived in one. And the other hall, we had a small guest, well, guest stateroom, it's called, okay. on the boat. And then uh, we used the other stateroom for storage. Because it was just her and I. And we'd go out for weeks or even months at a time without coming to shore for provisions. So we would need things that were um, that you could store without having to freeze on the refrigerator. Right. And we had a small amount of refrigerator freezer space we primarily used for meat. But a, a typical day is uh, you wake up. As soon as the sun comes up, because on a boat, you lose all track of, you don't use a clock. When it gets dark, you go to sleep. And when the sun comes up, you rise with the sun. So when you're sleeping, it's anchored and just... All sit. the time. When, we're, when Barbara and I were both asleep. So if we were moving between islands and we were going to have to sail overnight, then my wife Barbara and I would take shifts, about three hour to four hour shifts through the night. And... Um, watches because somebody always has to be um, awake when the boat's moving through the water right. in case the wind changes a boat gets in the way something uh, there's some kind of an engine casualty if you happen to be under engines so we would do that and when we reach our destination we would drop the anchor and back down on it with the engines to make sure it was set really well and then i would usually go in the water and dive the anchor to make sure it was set in the in the in the floor the sea right. floor and then i'd come back up and we'd start Making ma making martinis or whatever, you know, and uh, that's that was that was our life. I would catch fish, um, and we'd have that for dinner. We ate fresh fish. Um, that was our primary protein source was fish okay. that we caught off the boat. And um, whenever there was a, an island we went to where there was uh, maybe a little town or something on there, mm -hmm. we had a small boat called a dinghy. It's a little, yeah. little inflatable mm -hmm. boat with a outboard on it. We'd let that down in the water, and that was our car. We'd take it into the shore and go visit the people and have a drink with them and, wow. and come back. So uh, every day was different, right, because the the weather, um, what there is to do on that island. Sometimes we would just go have a beach day and hang out at the beach. Mm -hmm. Other times we'd snorkel or scuba dive, um, spearfish, fish. Um, we had these little paddle boards that we'd use, and we'd go around the island on them and uh it was, a, it was pretty much doing whatever we wanted to do. <laughs> it was a great life for a couple of years. Man, well, congratulations on that bonding period. Thanks. I know we're getting ready to end up. 20 minutes shoots by. If there's one thing that your friends, your family doesn't know about you, that's oh, wow. kind of a little kind of secret that you can share on my channel that well, won't get you locked up? No, no. I'll share something with you that uh, that I think a lot of people need to know. Um, and it's about stress. So I just described to you a life that's beautiful, that doesn't have much, you wouldn't think would have much stress in it at all, right? Yeah. My biggest worry was if I had the right lure for the fish I was trying to catch. Um, but when I came back and we moved from Fort Lauderdale, where we sold the boat, back to Texas, we're driving along the interstate, and I noticed over the top of the interstate those green and white signs that are over there, yeah. you know, that um, I couldn't see it as well as I expected to be able to see it. So I covered my eyes, and when I did, I noticed that when I was looking only through my right eye, it was blurry and darker than it was going through my left eye. So to cut this long story very short, I wound up going to an ophthalmologist. And they said, the problem is, and they said something I don't know because it's a scientific name I can't pronounce. But they said, the problem is you get a little bump on the back of your eye and it's caused by one of two things, either steroids. And of course I said, you're on to me and, um, uh, or stress. And I said, well, I'm not taking steroids. So it's stress. So I didn't know this, but all that worry over the weather, the navigation, whether the anchor was going to slip, 
uh, if the uh, diesels were going to continue to operate. All of that stuff was wearing on me in a way that I would have never expected. I didn't feel stressed, yet I was stressed. And so uh, it goes, the good news is it goes away over time. So as I've uh, come on shore and don't worry about my house floating away, it's gotten a lot less stressful. Wow. Yeah. You, you heard it right here on uh, Jim Austin Online, The Austin File. And th this has been very enjoyable to me, me too. sir, to get Thank to look, know a little bit more about you. And sometimes we move so fast in life that we don't take the time to really talk about and get to know each other. And uh, I've always knew you were an awesome guy, fella. And I appreciate, you know, our friendship. And all, I hadn't seen you when I ran into you at the Fort Worth Club. I hadn't seen you in years. Yep. And, Man, you gave me your card, and, and uh, I said, let's do a podcast, and, and here you are. I'm happy. Thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, happy so this is big time. <laughs> money, money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> getting ready to go see uh, his family up in the Baltimore area, and it has been my pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Go to Jim Austin Online, join my YouTube channel, and uh, become a subscriber. On my Facebook, LinkedIn, just communicate with my other 8,000 friends <laughs> on my newsletter. Thank you. Uh, we're going to sign off. Thank you, TD.